When we think about the function of platelets, most people say blood clotting. And that's correct. Platelets are involved in blood clotting, but they're actually involved a little bit more than that. Blood clotting is only one part of a process called hemostasis. Hemostasis is the process that stops bleeding. And platelets are involved in all stages of hemostasis and also in healing. When we look at the structure of platelets, um, platelets are also called thrombocytes, they're actually not full cells. The platelets are cell fragments. They're fragments of a large cell found in the bone marrow called a megakaryocyte. These big megakaryocytes are in the bone marrow and they sort of pinch off little bits and pieces that form the platelets or the thrombocytes. Because they're only fragments of a cell, the platelets do not have a nucleus or a lot of the other organelles that we associate with cells. Basically, a platelet is a little packet of membrane that contains a lot of cytoskeletal fragments and a lot of vesicles. Both of these things are important to the function of platelets, the cytoskeletal fragments that are in there and the vesicles, which we call granules, that secrete molecules that are important for the function of platelets. On average, you should have about 250,000 platelets per microliter of blood. So you should have fewer platelets than you do red blood cells, but you'd have more platelets than you do white blood cells. Let's take a closer look at this process of hemostasis that the platelets are so involved in. Now this is clearly a very important process because if you are bleeding, you need to stop bleeding so that you don't die. So hemostasis is a necessary uh, process in the body. There are three phases to hemostasis. The first one, the first part of hemostasis is called vasoconstriction or vascular spasm. In vasoconstriction, right after there's some sort of damage to the blood vessels, suddenly those blood vessels constrict. Now think about why that would be important. If you've damaged a blood vessel, you want to constrict it so that you reduce the amount of blood being lost through that damaged vessel. This vasoconstriction is triggered by the release of signals coming from the damaged cells themselves. And the platelets release serotonin that increases that vasoconstriction, that increases that vascular spasm. So that's good. You have an injured blood vessel, you constrict it down right away to reduce the amount of blood that's being lost. But there's still blood being lost through that damaged vessel. Somehow you need to block the opening. And this is where we find the second stage, the second phase of hemostasis, called the platelet plug. The platelet plug is a pile of platelets that forms quickly to block the opening of the vessel so that blood stops flowing through. This is not a strong structure and it's not going to last very long, but it's your immediate response to block the edge of the vessel so that you stop bleeding. The formation of a platelet plug is triggered when platelets stick to the damaged edges of a blood vessel. Now the inside of a blood vessel is normally very smooth, so the platelets won't stick to it. Whenever you damage a blood vessel, the damaged edges are rough and platelets will begin to stick. When a platelet sticks to the damaged edge of a blood vessel, there's a change in its cytoskeleton so that it changes shape and instead of being relatively small and compact, it reaches out these extensions. Now other platelets get stuck in the extensions of these activated platelets and those platelets become activated and change shape to catch more platelets that become activated to change shape too to catch more and more and more platelets. The other thing that happens with activated platelets is as they're changing their cytoskeleton, they degranulate. They dump out all of their granules. The molecules that are released in the platelet granules have a number of roles. We can increase that vascular spasm. We attract more platelets. Uh, there's a release of clotting factors to help with actual blood clot formation. There are growth factors to help with healing. All of these things are being released by the platelets as they degranulate as they're forming this big platelet plug. Now the platelet plug will stop the bleeding, but it's not permanent. It's a temporary fast forming structure. We need to be able to replace the platelet plug with something that's going to hang around a little bit better. That brings us to the third phase of hemostasis, which is actual blood clotting or coagulation. Blood clotting is a complex process. And by a complex process, I mean that it involves over 30 different chemical reactions, 
15 different protein clotting factors and a number of different non-protein cofactors that all have to work together to form a blood clot. Whenever we see a complicated process like this, the reason usually comes down to regulation. When you have a really complicated process with lots of steps, that allows many points of regulation so it doesn't happen when it's not supposed to. When we think about blood clotting, it's very important that we form a blood clot when we're bleeding, but it's very problematic to form blood clots when they're not needed. So we need to regulate the process carefully. That's why it's such a complex process. We're going to simplify this process by basically referring to a series of reactions. We have a series of reactions that's going to occur. One reaction activates a molecule that triggers the next reaction, which activates a factor to trigger the next reaction. So we have a series of reactions. These have to happen in order. That series of reactions leads ultimately to the activation of the enzyme thrombin. Thrombin is very important because thrombin is an enzyme that cuts the protein fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrinogen is a long protein produced by the liver that floats around in your plasma of your blood and doesn't do much of anything. But when we cut long fibrinogen down into little fibrin, the fibrin is sticky. This sticky fibrin gets linked together into a network. This sticky network of fibrin then catches red blood cells and platelets and forms the actual blood clot. So fibrin is the scaffold that catches all of the uh, blood cells and platelets to form a blood clot, a much stronger structure that can block a broken blood vessel until healing can occur. That healing is actually promoted by factors coming from platelets. Platelets release platelet-derived growth factor and other factors that help stimulate cell division and the production of extracellular matrix fibers in order to heal the tissue, to heal the damaged blood vessel. Once the damage has been healed, we need to get rid of the blood clot. Blood clots are strong structures that are hard to break down. In order to break down the blood clot, we actually have to trigger an entire different series of reactions that activates the enzyme plasmin. Plasmin is an enzyme that can break down fibrin and that will dissolve a blood clot. Because blood clotting is so necessary, it's important to understand the sorts of things that can go wrong. So there are a number of disorders involved in blood clotting, all the way from a failure of the blood to clot to too much blood clotting. The failure of the blood to clot leads to bleeding. Any little damage to a blood vessel and you keep bleeding and bleeding and you can eventually hemorrhage to death. Some of the things that can interfere with the ability of the blood to clot would be thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is a low platelet count. If you don't have enough platelets, then you're not going to be able to uh, effectively manage any of the stages of hemostasis, not only blood clotting. We also see the failure of the blood to clot um, in hemophilia. Hemophilia is a genetic disorder that affects one of the clotting factors. So remember those 15 different protein clotting factors you need for blood clotting to happen? If any of those has a genetic mutation in it, then you have problems with blood clotting. We can also see problems with blood clotting if any of those non-protein cofactors are missing, like vitamin K. Vitamin K is a cofactor for blood clotting, and if you don't have vitamin K, then the blood clotting cascade won't work, and you'll have trouble with bleeding. Um, liver disease also can lead to bleeding problems because most of the clotting factors that are involved come either from the platelets or from the liver. We talked about alpha and beta globulins that are necessary for blood clotting and also the fibrinogen that gets cut into fibrin that you need to form the blood clot. All of those come from the liver and if you don't have them, you don't form blood clots and you have bleeding problems. So to prevent bleeding out, we want to form as many blood clots as possible, right? Of course not. Too many blood clots can be just as problematic as not enough blood clots. The problem with forming unnecessary blood clots is that they can block the flow of blood through undamaged blood vessels. If I have a blood clot in my leg and I'm blocking the flow of blood to my leg, that's bad news for the cells in my leg. Um, we can also have problems blocking blood flow to the brain, which causes strokes, 
or other important areas of the body. So blood clots forming in undamaged vessels is a problem. Um, this can be caused by thrombocytosis. Thrombocytosis is a high number of platelets. If you have too many platelets, then you can trigger blood clotting too often. The risk of forming blood clots also increases if you have rough blood vessels where platelets can stick even if they're not damaged, or if you have poor blood flow, if all those factors are just sort of like sitting around um, without moving through your body, that can lead to formation of blood clots, or if your blood is too viscous, you can increase the likelihood of clots. A blood clot that forms in an undamaged blood vessel is called a thrombus. Um, and that can be enough of a problem on its own if you have a thrombus that forms and it stays in an unbroken blood vessel because it blocks blood flow down that vessel. Uh, we can see actually bigger problems with what's called an embolus. An embolus is a blood clot that will travel through the bloodstream. So you form a blood clot and if it can break free and then travel through your blood vessels, it can lodge in a very sensitive area of the body. It could lodge in the heart, in the lungs, or go up into the brain, and any of those is pretty bad news. Here's a quick animation that shows what happens with an embolism. So here we have a blood clot forming in the leg that travels up the blood vessels, and in this case gets pushed into the lungs. In the example shown, both of the arteries going to the lungs are now blocked with the blood clot. No blood is flowing to the lungs, and this person is in very, very dire straits.